My name is Danae, and I am retired and living with about five different autoimmune diseases, one of which is ILD. And if you want to go ahead and start to tell us about your ILD diagnosis story and how it came about that you found out that you have ILD. Okay. I was already seeing a rheumatologist for my Sjogren's and my RA, and I have some sort of autoimmune gut issues too. And I, my primary care doctor was a family practice doctor. And I'm a complicated patient, but because I have so many um, specialists, I stayed with her because she was a nice person. <laughs> but I started telling her in about 2017 that I was having great difficulty breathing. I live in Oregon, we get wildfires, and we had a really bad wildfire season that fall. And I went in to her and I just said, it's really bad now, I really can't. I would really like to see a pulmonologist. And she took her stethoscope and listened to my lungs. And she says, no, I can't refer you because I don't hear anything. Which is a really bad mistake because you don't hear ILD. It's not like COPD where it's not obstructive, it's restrictive. Exactly. So you might hear a little whistling or wheezing, but you don't hear what you would hear with somebody with an obstruction and full of mucus in their lungs which is showed that she was ignorant about lung disease. The problem for me was she wouldn't give me a referral to somebody who wasn't ignorant. And I knew I needed to see a pulmonologist. And I asked her what two or three times. And she said, I can't refer you if I don't hear anything. I came back for another appointment about a month later. I said, I'm still having trouble breathing. I really would want to see a pulmonologist. She listened to me again with her stethoscope and said, I just can't refer you. So I started of thinking, I need a second opinion. So I waited till I knew she was out of the office and I saw the covering physician for her. And I told her, Dr. So-and-so is not referring me, but I really want to see a pulmonologist. So she got a spirometer and had to use it. She says, oh, you really need to see a pulmonologist. Yeah. Know. And she was also a family practice doctor, but she was a more educated and open person. I got in with the best pulmonologist in town right away, which was a privilege because I had worked with him. I'm a registered dietitian in the, in the hospital. When I would cover ICU, I would work with him. He wasn't usually taking patients, but so it was a real privilege that I got to see him. And should I continue with what happened then? You can continue on. Okay. I went in and of course he had me do the spirometer too. And I'm trying to remember exactly what happened on the first session, but eventually we ended up doing some imaging and he said, I did have the ground glass opacities in my lungs. And he explained what that meant, that it's never going to heal. Those are dead cells and how it's critical that I get this under control. And he said, there are about 300 different kinds of ILD. But knowing your history and that you have about five autoimmune diseases, four autoimmune diseases, I think this is your fifth. <laughs> we said, if you really wanted to know, the only way to know what type you have, because I've had some exposures in my past. I lived in a house that had black mold. Mm. My first job in my 20s, I was an offset printer. And in those days, we cleaned printing presses with methylene chloride, which is what they oh, used wow. for gas in World War I. So I had some other exposures and he said, it's possible it's that, but I'm really pretty darn sure in your case, it's autoimmune. And he said, the only way we would know we would know is to do a lung biopsy, but because you're so immune compromised and on immune suppression, I just, that would be unethical for me to do that. So I'm just going to diagnose this as autoimmune and we'll be able to tell by how it progresses. And he said that life expectancy for autoimmune ILD is between five and 20 years. So it's a big range. Yeah, it's a big range. <laughs> so that was in 2017. And so that was seven years ago. And it's definitely progressed, but not as fast as it could have. It's affecting my life much more than it did in the beginning. Mm -hmm. Even if there weren't COVID and everybody refusing to wear masks, it still would be affecting my, it affects my ability to vacuum the house to do any gardening and that sort of thing, much more than it did say five to seven years ago, but not nearly as much as it could. So I'm very lucky. 
Got it. Yeah. And I remember that wildfire season. I live in California. So 2016, 2017 was crazy with all the wildfires. And I live in Long Beach, so not even close to the forests or anything, but there was just ash raining for days. Yeah. And I was wearing masks as well because I was like, oh my gosh, I don't know what's going on with my lungs. Mm -hmm. I myself am very interested in this in this project because I have some speculation that I may have also developed ILD. Whenever I get sick, I have to do ster I have to do prednisone and all of the inhalers every single time I get sick. And so I'm like just monitoring it, seeing what's going on and have trying you seen to a pulmonologist. I have not yet. I am a referral. Don't I wait. need to. I know I need to so much. I'm in the transition of moving back up to the Bay Area. So once I get settled up there, I will get my new rheumatologist to get me a thing. Yeah, no, for sure. Because yeah. he put me on the steroid inhalers and said, this is what's really going to work for your ILD. The rescue inhaler works for asthma. Mm -hmm. And the reason that I use the rescue inhaler with ILD is it's to open up the lungs enough that the steroid inhaler can actually get in there and help um, keep the ILD from progressing so fast. That makes sense. So the sooner you get started on that sort of thing, the better. Exactly. No, definitely. I know that you talked a little bit about the big no a little bit about the beginning of your diagnosis journey. And you said that you were having a hard time breathing because of the wildfires initially. But can you, if you look back and can you remember what you might have noticed as your very first symptom or like what that um, fatigue? But when you have RA and you have Sjogren's, you never know what the fatigue is from. But my fatigue was definitely worsening when my joints were not worsening. Got so it. that made me think, I, I think there's something going on with my lungs because my RA seems to be well controlled, but I'm having trouble breathing. Got it, that makes sense. And we talked a little bit about your treatment and, and what kind of the rescue inhalers versus steroid inhalers, but what does the treatment like on an everyday basis look like? And then like when you may have an exacerbation, what does it look like at that point? For me, I just met with my pulmonologist yesterday. I should have told him oh, we were going to do this. Perfect thing. timing. <laughs> he would be great for this, but he's really overworked. But because he's fabulous. But anyway, he just increased my number of times to use the inhaler. So my treatment now is every six hours I'm doing levobuterol. I can't do albuterol because of an allergy to milk protein which is used as a dispersant in a lot of inhalers. So for ILD patients, that's important to know if you are allergic to milk protein, it won't be listed on the, the medication. Yeah, that's very interesting. You need to know that. And I found out a whole different way. That's a whole other story. But anyway, I'm now doing two puffs of 80 microgram um, levobuterol every six hours, followed by 15 minutes later, two puffs of 80 milligram um, might be microgram. I just remember it's 80. <laughs> Q-bar. And that seems to be working well. The one issue is they're both sort of stimulants. So when I have to take them before bed, I don't sleep very well. Interesting. So. I didn't know that. I do have, I have the prescriptions for Q-bar and for albuterol. So I haven't been taking it on a consistent basis, but I probably should. Yes. Absolutely. I'm sorry. I'm getting into my health. No, I no, I'm like, I, that's why I'm also so interested in doing these presentations. Cause it's, I've been given the Q bar for a reason, right? I need to take it. Absolutely. I have to pay out of pocket. Medicare doesn't cover it for me. Oh, it's wow. But it's more expensive to lose your lungs. It, definitely. Absolutely. There, I wanted to mention this just like a side note, but RDs and health educators are like one in the same, right? Like right. with our careers. And um, I was also a certified diabetes educator, which is another yeah. <laughs> I started out as an intern with Satellite Healthcare, which is like a dialysis center. Oh, and wow. that's what I did my, my first internship with them. And I actually, I shadowed six different RDs and how they did patient education and things like that. So I have such a love for RDs and like how, oh, they, how they explain <laughs> things to patients because it's the closest that you're going to get to like how health educators are taught to be able to to speak with patients and things like that. I, back then, I even wrote a blog about following those <laughs> registered dietitians. And I did this whole project of creating kidney uh, and diabetes safe 
Filipino recipes because I'm Filipino. Oh, so wonderful. I did I did a, a lumpia recipe that didn't have as many of the sodium of sodium. Yeah. And Filipino food is really salty, right? Mm -hmm. It definitely <laughs> is. If someone ate my recipe that was a traditional Filipino, they'd be like, this is not Filipino food. It doesn't <laughs> taste the same, <laughs> but it's healthier for you. And that's what is important. So I want, I just wanted to mention that on a side note, just because uh, I... Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, that's how I started my career. So I'm so thankful to those registered dietitians that took me under their wing. So I even uh, like a little... little note. I've been retired now since March 12th, 2020, because I live in Oregon. And that was the day when I was driving to work. And I was already cutting my hours to 10 per week because mm -hmm. my illnesses. But I, I, that day, I heard our Oregon Health Authority director on the radio say, if you're over 65, don't go to work today. COVID is really taking off. You're higher risk. Anybody over 65 should be staying home. But I went to work to say goodbye to my patients. Yeah, but yeah that, it just so happened that it was all happening at that same time, huh? Like, you're like, yeah. I, yeah, no, we need to take care of our lungs at this point. There's no way. Absolutely, because the wildfires, because we had up here much worse wildfires in 2020. We had the highest particulate count that had ever been measured on Earth. Because oh he didn't always measure when there were volcanoes going off. Yeah, <laughs> but, of course. But it was like in the, like, 40,000 or something. And like you said, the ash coming out of the sky. And it was just insane. And I had already been diagnosed with ILD. So I knew how terrifyingly scary that was. So I paid money that I didn't have to have a furnace installed. And this is something that if people have the resources and they have ILD, you need a furnace that has a HEPA filter and a humidifier if you have Sjogren's. Yes. I think even with ILD, the humidifier is helpful. So I spent money that I shouldn't have spent, but I should have spent. Yeah, definitely. I just don't make much money, but I knew it will prolong my life to have a decent furnace with really good filtration. And I still use air purifiers in my room. I use the Coway because it's one of the better ones and less energy usage, but very effective. So I would recommend anybody with ILD, if you can't afford a furnace, at least get some good air purifiers that you can use in the rooms that you spend most of your time in, like the room you sleep in. And this is my art room, so I have one here. Yeah, definitely. That is great advice. I was wondering about like with your ILD and um, like exertion, like you said, like with gardening and um, any other physical activity, how much does it affect you and your breathing at, at those times? Uh, a lot. So I just really have to pace myself and take breaks. Got it. And I'm having to take them more now because it's progressed. So I'm going in for the um, pulmonary function tests. Um in three weeks. I haven't done them since COVID began because mm -hmm. I never wanted to go and breathe in a room in a little tiny phone booth sized box that I yeah. have breathed in. And he agreed, but now he said, now I think my pulmonologist said, now I think it's really time for us to do it. So we're going to schedule you at 7.30 on a Monday morning. So nobody's been in there for two days and we do air everything out. And you'll be the first patient. Everybody wearing, <laughs> we're wearing at 95 and you'll do the testing, and then you just immediately leave, and then you and I will discuss the results on telehealth. So that's what a good good pulmonologist will do for you. That's awesome. Wow. And if people are seeing pulmonologists that don't get it, then shop around. Yes, definitely. Wow. That is, that, that's how you should be treating patients that have, even if they don't request it, that's the biggest thing right. is that they're a lot of times it's okay. They're making a stink out of it. Then we'll adhere to what they say, but these are common practices that should be done for anybody who's in Everybody, even yeah. people who don't have ILD because everybody's vulnerable to COVID. Absolutely. You know, and it's not gone. So living with ILD in the, in the time of COVID, which is never going away is an incredible challenge. Definitely. When you start to feel it, is, does it feel like restricting? Is it like tight in your chest or what is the feeling of how it feels? I don't feel chest pain, but I feel there's a rock or a boulder on my chest and it's hard to just expand my lungs and get enough air. Got it. And I, I use an oximeter and my oxygen level doesn't drop that low. It drops to maybe 94 which isn't bad, yeah. but I'll still feel like I just can't get enough air in. I just can't breathe. 
So that's why we're going to do more pulmonary function tests soon. So I want people to know, believe your body. Even if you look at that oximeter and it says, oh, 94, 95, and your doctor says that's fine. It's not fine if your body's telling you it's not fine. And there is a difference between an exacerbation of ILD because the air is bad quality or you've been more active and, and anxiety and stress. And you will get written off as, oh, you're having trouble breathing because you're all tight because you're anxious. And no, you might be anxious because you can't breathe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, the it's it's frustrating because it's like a lot of the professionals are at the point where they're like you said overworked. There there's so many patients that need to be seen and not enough professionals. So they are writing off some people a l- I, when they're earlier in their disease like hey, I think you're fine for now. There's not you're not dying. We'll just see you in a right. few months again. And it's it's so frustrating because like, a year and a half yeah, they're like you have an appointment nowadays. You, you just can't. Even the good ones who want to see you, we've lost something like 20% of our physicians, our wow. experienced physicians over the last few years. Frequently, I call for an appointment, and the soon as they can get me in, is six to eight months away. That is crazy. That is it might so be different in a bigger town. I live in Salem, which Oregon, which is the capital, but it's not a very big town. But yeah. it's pretty much the same up in Portland because most of my specialists are in Portland. So it might be different when you get back to the Bay Area. <laughs> but Yeah. And do you, are you very sensitive to scents or oh, no sense. environmental? No sense. Nothing. Good question. You can't have anything scented. It will just shut your lungs down. At least that's my experience. Yeah. The so other people that I have interviewed have very similar experiences as well. Yeah. See, I live alone and that makes it so much easier. Easier. If I lived with somebody who used scented products, I I would just have to get a different roommate. Wow. It's just, scents are terrible. It's a big lifestyle change for sure. For me, because I've always limited them because of migraines, chronic migraines. Mm. But if you love scented stuff and you develop this disease, it's, you'll be sad. Yeah not having that anymore <laughs> you'll have to get into color and taste instead yes use your other senses yes. <laughs> and just the last question that i have here is what are some things that you want to tell ai arthritis patients to know about ild what do you want them to know about ild and any advice that you might have for anybody who may be suspecting that they might have ild fight hard, as hard as you can to see a pulmonologist, because that's the only person that can diagnose it. If you have any choices about pulmonologists, try to see one who actually specializes in restrictive lung disease and won't just think, oh, you don't have COPD, so you're not that important. You want somebody who looks at the big picture, fight hard for that, try to see them regularly, do whatever they tell you to do. Awesome. And it's hard to think, oh, I have to take these inhalers all the time. And I have to get a sleep study too, because sometimes it's interfering with your breathing when you're asleep and you don't know it. Sometimes the advice is hard, but you will you'll regret it if you don't follow it. And you will be glad that you did if you do. Absolutely. It. Thank you so much for that, Danae, and for sharing your story with us today. I know that you are an, an active member in the community and that you said that you help an immunocompromised support group and things like that. But it, it still always takes courage to be on camera, tell your story and give advice to other patients from me and the whole organization of AI Arthritis. We really appreciate you for coming and taking the interview today because it really will help to spread awareness for all the other AI Arthritis patients. I am happy to do this anytime because I taught that's what I did. So it doesn't make me nervous. Yeah. <laughs> and I care so much about, I just want people to get diagnosed early. It's again, we don't have a treatment. We don't have a cure, but maybe we will have a treatment in a few years. And so the more that we stand up for ourselves and, and build a community, because again, this is an invisible disability because we're not coughing up wads of mucus. People think we don't have lung disease. When we're sitting still, we look completely healthy. If you take a walk with somebody and you're gasping a little bit, then they might think, oh, but generally it's an easy to ignore diagnosis for other people around us. So we need to educate the people around us and you really need to avoid smoke. One more story, my um, rheumatologist, after I got diagnosed and we had 
in 2020, we had that incredibly horrible smoke event. And then in 2023, as this wildfire season was coming up, he said, if we start to have wildfires again, you need to get on a plane and go to Hawaii. <laughs> and I said, get on a plane with COVID? You're like, you're like that's <laughs> even more of a barrier. <laughs> and then he said, COVID will, will be less of a concern for you than the smoke. Wow, I, I that is that's telling. That, but, and I said, "Oh, so I have doctor's orders to go to Hawaii." And I wanted to say, "Is the doctor going to pay for it?" But I didn't. Yeah, is insurance going to pay for that? <laughs> <laughs> but um, I couldn't do that, of course. But anyway, yeah. that's cri how critical it is. Is smoke is your biggest enemy. So if you don't have a lot of resources, get you can buy these tape things that you can tape over your windows to stop smoke coming in and use the right tapes to pull all the paint off your window sills, but do everything you can to keep smoke out of your house if you live somewhere where there will be fires. I have all of my wheels turning and I'm like, we need to make a blog post of recommended like different yeah. products for people with ILD for sure. I think that'll, that should be one of our social media posts or something that we put together for this project. So I'll probably yeah, go back to you, you and pick your brain. Yeah. 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 That would be awesome. All okay. right. Well, thank you. I know you're busy and you need to go, but it was really great to meet you. Thank you for the work you're doing. Of course. It's really valuable. It's so important. Thank you so much. I had so much fun speaking with you today. So thank you again. My pleasure. Hey, have a great afternoon. Oh, you there's too. my dog. Oh, <laughs> bye. Bye. -bye.